Welcome back, Pounders, to another episode. We are very excited today. We have a special guest, Marshall Porter, coming from Alicorp AVC. This episode is brought to you in part by Underdog Fantasy. And this week, they're giving a $500 match bonus for anyone that signs up and deposits up to $500 match in bonus cash. They will also receive a mystery NFL Pick'em special. So it is time to get into action. Join us on Underdog Fantasy. Use the promo code PTT. Let's get into the episode. Welcome back, boys. We are back in the booth after two long weeks, which was far too long. And we come back to seeing the killer of Tupac was found today, which is very both exciting and not so exciting because we can no longer hold on to the the hope that he was still alive in Cuba somewhere. But we got a great episode, keeping it short with us. And then we got a awesome interview with Marshall Porter, who is a VC over at Alicorp. And we're going to be talking about thematics in the private sector. Shy, Joey, I know we wanted just to keep it to stocks. No weekly highlights or news today. So CrowdStrike, you want to start with? So CrowdStrike had a pretty major event last week. It got lost with all the noise around the feds. It was the same day which is unfortunate, but a lot of great news came out from that event. CrowdStrike's trading at a lot of terminal rates already, and then CFO dropped a couple of new bombs on us. The biggest one was previous target was like 20, 22% operation margin. Now the new forecast for operating margin is 28 to 32%. That is insane. That's not just like a slight tick up. That's a 50% increase in operating margin targets. While they're going to also forecast around, I think it's like 25% Kager for the next five to seven years while maintaining those kind of margins is insane. So after hearing that, CrowdStrike's just been executing flawlessly the past couple of years. They've always had the noise about Microsoft, like has it's going to be a competitor against them. How can they compete against Microsoft? Well, they have been. And now with these new targets, I'm going to up this position to like a 15% weight in my portfolio. Joey, do, don't you think these like yeah. margins are insane for the top line growth? Like once the world becomes even more messed up as it is already, like they're going to be more cyber attacks. That's how you attack countries now. It's more those yeah. like malware. Ta- like Vegas, right? Is a perfect example. Like so much chaos happened in Vegas with that cyber attack. That's just like going to be the normal kind of attacks going forward. And you need the all in one platform that CrowdStrike essentially is. And they're going to thrive. I'm. I see this being a mega cap, like decade and over a decade down the line. But it's definitely a great stock to own, and it's going to be my bellwether for sure going forward. Yeah, it's a top five position of mine. I want to say it's number four, and it mostly got there on its own just because of how well it's performed and delivered. But yeah, it, I put it right up there with Palo Alto Networks and Zscaler as like the gold standard in cybersecurity. And like you said cyber attacks, everything related to it, it's only getting worse out there. I think a lot of companies have said in times where you're trying to reduce spending, it's not an area that is like discretionary. They just have to be spending. It's completely necessary. And Las Vegas is a good example. It's a growing issue. Companies have to invest in it. And it seems like CrowdStrike is the way that they're going to do that. I definitely see this being a significantly larger company 10 years down the line. And I have no plans to sell it, only plans to add to it if we ever get a good Joe, you- I also forgot to mention they're going to be gap positive. So there's no more argument like, oh, like they're they're profitable, but not really profitable because there's a lot of SBC noise. They're going to be profitable now on the gap basis. Would not be surprised if you see them in the S&P going forward because of the first like quarter of gap profitability is going to be the norm going forward. So that's also a good thing to have in your stock as an actual gap profitable company. New uh, definition you taught me today, GARP, Joey. What is GARP for those that don't know? GARP, I mean, it's a throwback term. It seems everybody abandoned it once growth became a way of life for so many people. But so GARP, it's also people will say GARP, but it's growth at a reasonable price. Some people will say growth at a reasonable valuation. But 
It's essentially rather than going for the companies that are growing the top line at 50, 60% or triple digits, something like that. You're looking for the companies that are almost like the steady eddy growth stocks where they're going to be growing say the top line at 20%. They're growing earnings at 20% and they're trading at 20 times those. So something you could say is GARP right now would even be like a Google where they're growing high teens, trading at decent multiples of earnings and free cash flow. Amazon might not fit that narrative just because it's their earnings are a little bit different since they're investing so much and growing right now. But yeah, that's where we were talking with how the market's been towards growth of late. I've been shifting more towards, okay, let's get away from the hyper growth style stocks and keep it more towards the GARP names just because they'll hold up better in a market that were to turn. But you don't want to go for like the deep value names because you see even like a PayPal that they're almost a, a, in that deep value category now. And it gets to the point where a very inexpensive stock can get cheaper. But if you could find a stock that's held up well, continues to grow, continues to deliver, that's still trading at a reasonable valuation, those kind of fit that GARP playbook. So to give you some more names, on the, I have a GARP watch list. Adobe's on there. Google is, Microsoft's on there. ServiceNow is on there. Apollo Networks is on there. High quality stocks that are just like so solid that you can rely on. Beach stocks almost. You can put a title on the those GARP lists. Those are the kind of stocks that you want to hold during volatile markets. I don't know if there's any beach stocks right now. I don't know if it's, it's safe. It's winter time. Some big news that I do want to touch on, actually. I know we said we would not go over some news, but uh, GameStop named Ryan Cohen as the new CEO. Is that something? Ryan Cohen's a beast, but does that take them out of the meme stock or revive the meme stock? They will forever be a meme stock with the debt that they have and the lack of growth. It's nice to see Ryan Cohen not getting like a dollar in salary or like benefits being that role, but do not go anywhere near GameStop. Don't waste your money on that, especially with the downturn the market's been the past month or two. There's so many great... In the universe of names and stocks in the market, I don't understand why you would choose GameStop. There's a lot better turnaround stories if you're looking for one, but I just would stay away from that stock for sure. Yeah, it's very interesting. I feel like GameStop just hasn't been in the news in a while and they needed a reason to get it back in there. So it's... Yeah, let's get Ryan Cohen as a headliner. But yeah, the whole CEO pay thing, not getting paid, yeah, has so much equity in that company that it's, I don't know. It's interesting. I, I want nothing to do with it. But you know, Ryan Cohen name that I have been looking at closer is Chewy, just because I look at that stock, it's trading at, it's got a market cap of $7.8 billion right now. We all know and love Chewy, anybody with an animal likely uses it for something. Their net sales, $2.7 billion, growing 14%. I was checking on what the auto ship sales are, but it's like 74% of their total sales. So when I'm doing the math here, it's looking at the business that they're going to do this year, it's almost trading at one times auto ship sales, which is pretty wild. So I'm going to say a cringeworthy uh, statement. Chewy is definitely in the doghouse. I think that they're going to probably get acquired. Honestly, they'll probably get acquired next year. I mean, it's too cheap of a stock, but so necessary in so many lives every day. It's bound to have some vertical integration if a company wants to acquire them. Don't know why Amazon still has not Maybe they just want to waste money on AI right now, even though they're so far behind all the other big players. They can dump a bunch of money in AI. That's probably their strategy, but I think they should definitely look into acquiring Chewy. And there's a lot of these e-commerce names that need to be rolled up. I'm still, I'm shocked that Wayfair is still a public company. I thought they would have been scooped up by a Walmart or someone. It's one of the bigger players. I feel like Chewy's now in that, in that realm where they're so inexpensive, they could be scooped up. Then you even look at like on Etsy, the two-sided marketplaces that are trading a very inexpensive valuation. It's got to be an area that private equity is looking at, but. Again, there's so many deals out there that maybe they don't even know where to start. Or they're scared of consumers. 
like what consumers will be like next year. If there's going to be a big flip on spending. I know right now a lot of consumers are spending money on their credit cards and that's how the a lot of these companies you would assume would be struggling aren't. I don't think that'll be the case next year. So maybe there's going by like a wait and see approach before making these kind of acquisitions. Because a lot of the acquisitions we've seen are B2B, not really B2C companies. It does make sense with, uh, I want to say credit card debt was over a trillion and now you've got the uh, student loan payments are going to start kicking up in October, is it? That's coming up. That's like next week. So yeah, maybe, yeah, the cash strapped consumers are going to be more strapped for cash. And then as everybody starts losing their jobs, having to pay these, uh, it could get pretty ugly for the consumer out there. But hey, at least you don't have to worry about buying a house at 8%. <laughs> well, Lululemon and uh, Peloton announced a five-year strategic partnership. So people can stay in their homes. And Man, with- <laughs> I, this was one of the most obvious deals. I, I think we talked about this on a podcast before. I know we talked about it because I, I really did not like their acquisition of Mirror a long time ago. And I didn't like the Peloton was wasting time in the apparel space. I always thought these two should hook up and just let Lululemon manufacture, design, do everything for Peloton's apparel, have Peloton just start pushing Lulu. I mean, that's a match that made much more sense. But when Lulu bought Mirror, Peloton was probably like a $20 billion company, so they never would have paid up for them. But yeah, this makes perfect sense. And I hope they start releasing some new line of apparel. It goes right in with like the shoes. They could help Peloton so much on the manufacturing side when it comes to that. This is a a partnership that makes perfect sense to me. Last thing, and then we'll get into the uh, interview with Marshall, which was phenomenal. We haven't talked about Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey. Yeah. Let's talk about Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey. Real or not real? You think it's just a publicity stunt? Uh, I think Travis Kelsey is too real to keep fake. He's a, I love him. I hate, I was, but my girlfriend did that TikTok trend asking me like, are you happy that Travis Kelsey is now on the map? And I was just like, I was pissed at her because he's like a multi Super Bowl champion. Like he came from adversity too in college. Like his, he had some drinking drug problems and definitely came up finally from that. And he's always been a good guy. So I think it's real, but I have an Amazon conspiracy theory on it. They both have Amazon or Netflix specials coming out. So they put them together to beef up the ratings for both of them. <laughs> and then there'll be a song about Travis Kelsey too. Joey, you brought this up. Any commentary on this? I just, I made the mistake of clicking on one video on TikTok and now it's all I really see. It's. You know, whether it's, yeah, the girls saying it to the guys and guys saying it to the girls, like who put who on the map. I think it's funny, but just don't click on any of those videos on TikTok or your algorithm's just completely destroyed. All right, let's send it on over to Marshall Porter from Alley Corp. Marshall is the general partner leading the diversified technology team at Alley Corp, focusing most of his time on early stage investments and incubations across the consumer and enterprise with a particular focus on the marketplace, e-commerce, and tools that power both of those. Prior to Alicorp, Marshall held leadership roles in several marketplace businesses, U.S. CEO at GymPass, many people are familiar with, that was a great company. And previous to that, he was president of Spring, which was acquired by ShopRunner, where he was the chief strategy officer and senior vice president and general manager of the Guilt Group. So welcome to Pounding the Table, Marshall. We're very excited to have you. Would love to hear about your experience coming from the operator side and how that's helped you now in the VC role. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, just a, a quick background on that operating side, almost 20 years before I joined this side of the table on that side of the table operating, doing all those things. And even going back 20 years or, or more, uh, building the first marketplace for mobile applications at Handango out of grad school, I sort of had that opportunity. Do I go the consulting path? and do a lot of decks and support partners and strategy worker juggle, build something. And I loved the, the idea of building businesses and was given way too much responsibility, way too early of an age. And you just get, get addicted to that drug, right? And, and you build companies, you can see your impact, not quarter by quarter, year by year, but in some cases, minute by minute, and you see numbers come in and, and that's just an adrenaline rush that you can't replicate anywhere else. And so doing marketplaces at Hindango, at Spring, at Gym Pass, the, the retail side at Gilt's, uh, has been just an extraordinary uh, run of experiences and most importantly, people that have supported me and backed me along that way that have made this possible. 
but I had these experiences uh, when I became more senior raising money, working with venture capitalists, working with investors across the spectrum. And just that realization that you can really add a lot of value as an operator. Uh, I think there's a skill set that financial VCs bring that is incredibly important understanding the markets and understanding leverage and financial models. But the operator side, understanding the hearts and minds that are involved in building a business. It's not just sell A1 plus B1 is C1. It's really, how do I get my customers to do this? How do I get them to buy this vision? How do I then sell the why to my employees? And together we build something that's enduring and a great company. Uh, and so it's just a different lens. And I think it's complementary to what a lot of the traditional VCs have brought, but I'm having a blast and uh, consider myself super lucky to get to work both with Alicorp, but also with this team. Yeah. And then just one thing specific to Alicorp, like coming from that operator side, do you feel like a sense of empathy and, and understanding of what founders are going through actually coaching them? Because a lot of this battle is mentally tough, right? You're waking up, maybe you don't have a whole team. You're not venture back quite yet and you're dealing with these sleepless nights. So has that been very helpful in gaining the trust of some of the founders you're working with? Absolutely. And you see it on both sides, right? So before when we're just building that relationship, trying to figure out if we want to partner with that founder and build a business for the next seven, 10, 15 years, uh, the empathy and the kind of relationship you can build is a pretty deep one and sort of what their fears are, what their hopes are, what their dreams are. And then post relationship, really digging in on how to make that come to reality. And sometimes it's moderating the highest of highs when they have a huge win and you celebrate that with them, but keep them focused. And sometimes that's the lowest of lows when, I mean, recently times have been tough and the more companies had layoffs, right? And so how do you cut costs? What are the conversations that you need to have? What are the mistakes that I've made that I can ensure that they don't make or try to prevent them from making? And so I think it's a different kind of relationship. It's built on empathy. It's built on a shared understanding that hopefully we can make that journey smoother for them because it is such a roller coaster when you're a founder or when you're that operating team. And so bringing that to the table, I think helps a lot. So my corporate experience is for a Fortune 10 company that specializes in like M&A deals. In the past year, there's been a lot of belt tightening on the green light process, which deals you should push through or not. It's gone better, but I want to see on your side, like the beaded tech deals, it, has it improved the climate or is it still in that phase that we've been in the past year of just pause and only push through the home runs. I mean, 18 months ago, things got really tight, right? And there are a bunch of events that happened probably last March, April, with, between interest rates, between things happening in the markets. Everyone sort of got back uh, and focused on basics and fundamentals. And I think you saw that in the MA activity, specifically in the areas you're talking about. With the interest rate environment, I think people have gotten used to where rates are today. And so I think that initial shock of what's the world going to be like is we've all digested that. We know where things are going. We have a decent roadmap, even from the Fed, of how that's going to look. And even this morning, I don't know when you guys will push this out, but Splunk getting bought for $28 billion, mm -hmm. the Clavio IPO, the Instacart IPO, I think that's going to have a really significant positive impact on the markets. In our world, the later stage side of venture has been a little slow to very slow because those later stage growth investors are trying to figure out what the market is and where the market is. We see public company marks. We don't know what the private company mark is. But now that it feels like it's healthy on the exit side, we know what those valuations should be. The more we digest the current environment, the more you see corporate M&A happening, the more you have exits, whether it's private or whether it's public markets, that's going to help all of us. And so I do think the belt tightening, that getting back to fundamentals, you saw the earnings throughout this people that had their year of focus and efficiency and in the words of some, but that's going to have a really positive long-term effect from this point forward, I hope. I've been saying for months that specifically the cybersecurity sector is going to be a lot of consolidation. And we've seen this with Splunk today. And I'm sure a couple of names will come to light in the coming months. Is there any kind of sector that you anticipate there are going to be similar type of consolidation? Would it be like workplace products or even something like on streamlining AI through their initial technology they currently have right now? Yeah, I think in general, it's those companies that can bring technology. It's always a build and buy conversation, right? And so from an M&A perspective, it's can we buy this or do we need to go build it? If you're a really big public company, you're often going to take those quantum leaps forward by acquiring a team that's built something instead of trying to, to build it yourself. It's just very difficult to have those teams building something truly innovative in these giant corporations. And so I think you'll continue to see consolidation in those areas where it matters. Cybersecurity is a space that we are really interested in. Uh, you look at what's happening there. There just aren't enough tools to address the problem and the problem gets more complicated. The 
the attackers get more sophisticated. And so there are increasingly more and more companies being created there that um, are going to be valuable in the future. And I think they'll get acquired. And so you'll see consolidation there. We focus on really four areas. We, and just to back up on Alicorp, we have four teams. We have a, a healthcare team that is just remarkable. They're most focused on value-based care and care delivery. We have a social impact team that is still profit focused, uh, but they're focusing on things that really impact that part of the world. Uh, we have a robotics team. The trend of automation feels so obvious to us. And that's a thesis of, if you think about 15 years ago, employees were nine or $12 an hour. Industrial warehouse space was $9 a square foot. Um, it just didn't make sense to make massive CapEx investments in automation. Today, employees are $25 an hour. UPS workers are getting 160, 170 a year. UAW workers are going to get close to that. Um, real estate is at 97, 99% capacity from an industrial perspective. There's a lot of really good economic reason to go into automation and robotics now. And that's just on that side of the world. Then you put on what technology enables, whether it's forest clearing or roofing or, or whatnot. We deeply believe in that trend going forward a decade and beyond. And then there's the group that I get to be a part of, Versify Technologies, but that's just a euphemism for everything else. And so we joke that's 82% of GDP, but we lean back into what we've always operated in, which for us is marketplaces, uh, developer tools and cybersecurity is a huge focus for us. Semiconductors and nanomaterials. We have somebody on the team who's just brilliant and, and very special there. And then consumer. And so we focus on those areas and that's where we continue to see a lot of opportunities to play out. I had a quick question, just Joey, I know you're going to go next here, but on the semiconductor piece, right? Like how, how close are you guys watching? Obviously you have seen the news with Taiwan and watching everything that's happening with China. Chips Act is obviously very recent for us as well. How do you see this global economy shaping up and, and how much are you guys watching the global news effectively of what's happening and how are you guys, do you guys have people on the inside and in the government kind of understanding when these things are going to be happening? Yeah, no secret sources on our side, but you can clearly see the trend, right? Whether it's the geopolitical side in, in Taiwan or China. But the other trend here, super important that we pay attention to and have pieces around is that just the nearshoring and onshoring piece. I think in the pandemic, we all saw how vulnerable the supply chains can be to disruptions when you have this just-in-time system that's spread around the world. When you play it out, it's better to have that closer to home, whether that's in Mexico and there's a booming economy in Mexico with factories popping up around Monterey and whatnot or whether it's bringing back to the U.S. and U.S. manufacturing is growing like it hasn't grown in, in decades. Uh, and then you throw in the semiconductor piece on top of that with the national security part, the investment from the government to try to spearhead that. Our biggest concern there, and, and it's really a concern with all of our companies and everything we incubate is talent, right? How do we make sure that whether it's on a macro level the U.S., whether it's an industry level with semiconductors, do we have the talent to go do that? TSMC is building these incredible factories in the U.S. and they're airlifting people into the U.S. from Taiwan because we don't have enough people here who are trained to do that. They're now using robots to let people effectively zoom in to the floors to watch the floor being built or to watch it actually in production. The appetite to compete here is great. We're, we're really intrigued and encouraged by that. I think the real risk that we want to make sure that we're aware of with everything is talent. And that's true whether we're investing in a company, incubating a company, or trying to pick out a trend. So looking at your recent investments and in your portfolio, there's a lot of B2B SaaS. And it seems to be you're completely focused on everything business to business. You don't really seem to have the consumer focus like we've seen recently with like an Instacart type IPO. Is that something that you found as like a secret sauce to your success? Or is it more so businesses aren't as fragile as consumers when you're heading into a recession? Yeah. So on, on the macro side of it, we don't think about sort of that short term or even the midterm economic risk, right? If you're going to build a great company, it's going to endure regardless. And clearly the headwinds of starting a company into that kind of environment or material and yet to consider that. I think for us, it's more about if we take consumer e-commerce, like Kevin likes to talk about, our founder likes to talk about what needs to be built, right? I can get anything delivered to my house in hours or most a day. What is the thing that needs to exist? And so I think we don't have a great answer to that. What I do have a lot of questions around is you have all these companies in the consumer and e-commerce landscape and retail that have been built in the last, call it 10 years, and they were able to pursue growth. And so we have a bunch of marketing companies that are really facilitating growth. They threw a lot of money at this, whether it's the easy button, as I call it, with paid search and paid social, or whether it's more organic with partnerships and biz dev and a virality and a product like growth. Um, they haven't focused as much on efficiency. And so if you step back and look at e-commerce growth, I think Constatista has this. Over the next five or six years, 
e-commerce as a whole is going to grow a little bit. And the, really the growth when you break it down is all in food, beverage, and then the, the category they call DIY and hobbies, which is a little nebulous. So the opportunities are to either sell to customers outside the US, outside of that constrained growth, which is really interesting and something that we spend a lot of time thinking about. We'll do something there. Or it's to become more efficient and become profitable because the demands are on these companies that raise a lot of money. How do I get to a place where I can sustain this business and not have to continue to raise it increasingly onerous capitalization issues? Um, and so you think then about returns. It's really hard to find an apparel retailer that doesn't have a 30, 40% return rate. I know of some that have 60 and 70% return rates. That's an enormous cost, not just in the logistics back and forth, but you sell something at full price. By the time you get it back, you need to resell it. It's probably on sale. Or if you sold them at sale originally, it's probably on clearance by the time it's back in the system. So the margin degradations are a really big issue there. That's probably a trillion dollar problem just in the US. And then you think about logistics. How many of us get a box from pick a retailer and only a quarter of the box is full of the stuff you ordered, the rest of it's air? That has a cost in terms of dimensional weights versus the actual weight itself. And then even inventory planning, right? It still bothers me to a large degree, having spent an inadvertent decade in fashion, as I call it, that we're trying to cover all human beings with roughly four or five sizes, like that small, medium, large, extra large. In an era of automation, can I build the shirt for you when you order it? Instead of having to effectively say nine months in advance as a buyer at Gap, let's buy 800,000 of those t-shirts and hopefully I'm close. And if I'm not close, we can mark it down. But the waste that comes and there's the, the environmental waste and the economic waste of having to make those decisions, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity in inventory planning, which by the way, when that buyer is making that decision, they have a few tools, but it's not an exaggeration to say a lot of those decisions are made from an Excel spreadsheet and like intuition. And in an area of data science and AI and ML and automation, that feels like it's antiquated to us. And so I think there's a ton of opportunity there, but it's not on the creating new product side. It's the optimization side in retail in particular. And, and as I see how you're like framing almost how you look at it, it does align exactly how I see with your portfolio. So when you're talking efficiency, you're almost aligning your investment style with where companies are having to go because money is no longer free like it was back 2009 when the last big startup boom was happening or even during the COVID boom with 0% interest rates ever, everywhere you can go. So are you almost aligning your investments with where companies are being forced to go given how expensive money has become because that's where they're being forced to. So that's where the money is and that's essentially where you're seeing the growth. Yeah, we think of our investments and incubations. We do both and really two frames. One is the pain. And, and this comes from bottoms up conversations, right? Talking with other operators, a lot of times we say, what are you spending too much time or too much money on? And so that's the today problem. These are the things that are solvable today. We you know there's a market today, there's a buyer today, et cetera. And then the other thing we think about beyond pains is what are the trends? What do we want to really lean into over the next 10 years? And I think when you look back at, for example, MongoDB, we, we saw a clear trend and an opportunity there. And so if you think about the trends we're thinking a lot about right now, it's what we're calling internally retail 3.0. It's what we just talked about in terms of what are we doing for returns, for inventory management? How do we become more efficient? Or how do we sell to more customers, not just in the US, but outside the US? Um, the nearshoring and onshoring of the supply chain, I think, is a trend that's going to play out over the next decade. Wellness is one that we're super interested in, both from a healthcare perspective, but also a consumer perspective. There has been a huge push towards longevity. Peter T has got the best selling book in the US. GLP-1s are coming to market. 40% of Americans are obese. There are very well could be a revolution in wellness over the next 10 years in the US and, and across the globe. Um, cybersecurity, we spend a lot of time on. Mm -hmm. And then semiconductors themselves, what's going to happen there? Across those six trends, my team in particular spent a lot of time thinking about what can we build or what do we partner with the team already building if we can't find the team in that space today? I'll give you an example. We love marketplaces. It's what I've grown up in and Susanna on our team has grown up in. We spend a lot of time thinking about, we built a company called Nomad Health. Nomad is a marketplace for, for nurses, right? It's sort of the nurses that travel around. Amazing business. What can we learn from that? We started looking at, are there other types of, of workers that are highly paid, somewhat transient, and ended up looking at the maritime space because enormous industry, not much technology happening there historically. Uh, decided that it was actually really hard. There's regulation issues, there's visa issues. And so we kept looking at that space and discovered that you know, there still isn't really a great way if your boiler breaks down in Cartagena to find the boiler in Cartagena or find the pipe you need in Manila. And so if you look at what, how that happens today, it's brokers, it's agents, it's 
websites with grainy photos and blue underlined links like it's 1996. There's a lot of innovation that needs to happen and it's just never come about. So we'll start a company in that space. And that's sort of in that B2B trend where there are a hundred trillion dollars a year traded between enterprises. 50% of that, $50 trillion a year is either that through fax machine or in person. And so you start to break down the industries that are sort of done through agents, through brokers, through fax machines, and you identify some opportunities where, you know, that should probably change. And I think there are parts of the world like that too. We struggle to go to Latin America where we have a handful of investments and you walk around any large Latin American city and like, gosh, I think this is going to be different in 10 years. And you identify all these opportunities, whether it's business formation, whether it's technology and, and medical practices or whatnot. Uh, and that's a trend that we've thought a lot about. We've got nine or 10 investments in the region. Um, but those are the kinds of things we think got. So it really is pains. What's, what are we hearing today in the market? What are those opportunities to invest in or to incubate? And then also what are the trends and how do we lean into those and either find the great teams building in those great markets or incubate something ourselves? I was just sitting with this woman yesterday and she brought up this McKinsey case study that was saying by 2025, I think, I want to get this data correct, but it was like 70% of the wealth will actually be with women now, which I thought was like, oh my God, that's in four years. That's not like 30 years from now. Have you guys been looking into yeah. that at all? Any investments in that space for women and, and seeing this transfer of wealth is going to be happening with the baby boomers? And another thing that you mentioned was that like within the first 90 days or something of a husband passing away, the women typically will then fire their financial advisor. She was saying, walking through like some of that data. So I found that Good like her. mind blowing that all of this is going to be tra- in the next like four years. So I-, I was curious how you guys are looking into that at all. Yeah, so there are three big demographic trends that we, we keep a clear fire on. One is the elevation way too late, decades too late of women in, in the world and families and business and, and overall in terms of being empowered in the way that men historically have taken. Uh, and so we look there. The other one that we look at a lot is, I think it's by 2034, there'll be more people over 65 in the US than children. So the aging demographic, and that correlates to number three, which is just the tsunami of SMBs that are going to transition from one generation that's now 60, 70, to the next generation that's 30, 40, 50, and the technology that will probably get put into those. So enormous opportunities in SMBs. So we're constantly playing in those. The last one, I have a company called Relay Commerce. Uh, that's all about SMB uh, sales enablement, the d- digital enablement there. Company's growing like crazy, an amazing team. I'm really excited about that one. Uh, still early stage, but that team executes so well. Uh, and then on the women's side, we actually co-office with a firm called BBG, which is another of my mentors named Susan Lyon and her firm, and they only invest in women-led companies. So we spend a lot of time with them digging into these trends, looking at investments together, huge fans of them, and they have several peers that are doing similar things, but that's just a trend that's not going away. We haven't made any investments in the fintech space there. Personal finance is something we talk about every day. On the trend side, though, those are things that we spend a lot of time thinking about. What are the needs that are coming from these trends that are emerging, whether it's the emergency and elevation, further elevation of women, whether it's the aging part or whether it's SMB part, and just enormous opportunities there that we look at all the time. So we've talked a lot about your thematics in, from a 50,000 foot view. Going into some of your most recent investments like Rogo, BoxHub, InCharge AI, as well as Relay Commerce. Could you just touch on a little bit about what excited you about each of those companies? Yeah, I think they're actually all indicative of those themes that we really went into, right? So InCharge AI is a special team coming out of Princeton, probably 30, 40, 50 people now building the next generation of AI edge enabled chips. They have a unique combination of hardware and software that outperforms pretty much anything on the market. And so we're incredibly excited about what that team is building. Joseph, who leads our semiconductors and material sciences practice, sort of is involved there, found that team, and we're very excited about that business. Rogo is a business sort of on that. It, it was AI before AI was hot. So in, in a way, this was Chad GPT before we had Chad GPT. They effectively take that same technology and from a use case perspective, put it on your own private cloud, your own private information with a particular emphasis on financial firms. So if you're a large investment bank and you want to know what's happening in the world or what your previous deals were, you can effectively have a chatbot that looks at all that information, whether it's a market information or deal flow information memorandum information, incredibly powerful technology that's getting a lot of traction within the financial services world. And then BoxHub on the marketplaces side, of all things, a marketplace for shipping containers. And so right now, if you go to Google and you say, I want to buy a shipping container, you get a ton of fax machines and brokers that pop up that can deliver it. It might be who knows where, 
the condition and suspect are questionable. You don't know anything about the history of that container. Box Hub is this incredible team. They're based in Toronto of all places with a great background in the industry. And you think about what founder, what makes a founder special, it's that ability to sell, to story tell, and the unique insight from the industry is often a key ingredient there. The Box Hub team is extraordinary and they're building that marketplace where all online, I can say, I want to buy a shipping container or 10. And so they're selling to retailers, to construction sites, to farmers, to all sorts of different constituents. And I think the number is something like $28 billion of shipping containers will be retired in the next two years. So an enormous market you don't think of every day, although now I walk through my town in Connecticut and I see shipping containers across the street and schoolyards and at retailers and everywhere now that I'm aware of it. Uh, fun little practice. Next time you're walking through a town, just notice all the shipping containers. And so that's a, a business that we think has just a really bright future. You know, what's weird about that is, so I have a weird obsession with shipping container architecture. Like I love the houses that are built out of it. I, there, I have a Pinterest. You can do so many things. It's the incredible. three things I've bonds on Pinterest. Yeah, the three things I follow on Pinterest were CrossFit workouts, shipping container architecture, and <laughs> and like home gym designs. So and that's kind of where it lies. And <laughs> yeah, it's so weird. People don't realize like every construction site, they're going to have multiple mobile mini, mobile modular type shipping containers that people are storing stuff in. Look behind Target and Walmart around the holidays. They're everywhere. And so I have a friend, Lee Levette, he owns CrossFit Winter Garden in Florida. And he has the same obsession with the architecture side that he was even saying there's companies that are putting small gyms inside shipping containers. So like people that want to just work out by themselves rather than in a whole gym, they're just in these containers. That's a unicorn so. company then, Joey. And yeah. So <laughs> you see like all these companies. So I actually, once you said that, I remembered Box Hub, they recently raised some capital. And of course, as soon as I Google it, I could see I've already clicked the link and like researched into them. So uh, it's pretty cool that you're invested in them. That is a very, yeah, they, they are ubiquitous, but that is a team. When you think about the investment side, the team is so important, right? Capital is kind of commodity in the world. Ideas are valueless. They have no value on their own, but the magic of Alley Corp historically, and hopefully we continue this long in the future is taking an incredible team, giving them the capital with their idea. And then in, in some ways, getting out of the way and letting the team do what they do. If we back the right people that are incredible and they can sell and they can recruit, they can raise money. That's really where the magic comes from. It's us being able to work with those people and those people really being powered to go build a great business that endures. I just find it fascinating that everything is cyclical in life, right? There's all this talk about AI, but you can't AI ship a container overseas right now. There still needs to be a physical movement of that, right? in general, as companies are, are coming to VCs, right? What's the best approach? I'm sure you get a million different emails of deal flow. What catches your eye when you see an email come through? And when, like, how, how does a person like me, for instance, or anyone that's listening, they have a great idea. They have a business that, that is starting to produce. What's your advice to anyone that's trying to crack into a VC? Yeah. So the things that catch our eye are, are that unique insight, right? What, what is something that's not consensus or that people just don't know about the market? It could be that hey, it's really hard to buy a shipping container. And, and we've spent a lot of time thinking about this and working in that space. And so backing Max and his team in Toronto and Box Hub was a no-brainer for us. Uh, but having that unique insight, I think, is super important and very compelling. And being able to storytell. And that part of that is your second question, how do you effectively break through all the noise? We'll probably invest in less than 1% of the companies we see this year. Uh, getting in front of us, a lot of times it's just about that network. And part of being a, a great founder is being resourceful and figuring out how to get things done that are impossible. How do you get somebody to introduce you and your idea to us? I mean, if we're honest, the cold email, the cold LinkedIn thing is really low odds of, of breaking through. But if you have somebody that we know from industry or from the investment community say that we should meet this founder, which is a, a majority of my meetings, um, that matters. And so that vote of confidence, having the resourcefulness to know that not only can this person get to me, but when they have to go sell to a customer, they know how to get to the customers mm -hmm. often or hard to get their attention. And even when I think about my gym pass experience, the biggest roadblock wasn't the product. The product's amazing. And the user experience is phenomenal. Everybody wants what we were offering, but selling to enterprise, it was, I could take class pass and I'm not going to get fired for that, right? It's the incumbent. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows about it. It's beloved as a consumer product. Gym pass is the better product but no one had heard of it at the time. Am I going to get fired for making that thing? Are my employees going to complain they didn't do class path instead, right. even though that product is better? And so that resourcefulness on the founder's side of how do I get to that investor in a way that's compelling is often foretelling of how they'll pursue customers and, and recruits as well, because they got to build a team and, and that's a big part of it. So it's just one data point that's super important that shows us they can get things done. 
Awesome. Well, Marshall, thank you so much for your time today. This was uh, fascinating. I know Joey threw a few curveballs here. And so, and no, all good fun. Thanks so much uh, again sure. for your time. And uh, everyone check out Alley Corp. So it's AlleyCorp.com is the, the site. AlleyCorp.com. We're all there. Fantastic. Awesome. Thanks again, Marshall. Hey, thanks, Avi. Thanks, Joey. Pounding on the table for my team. Every night I flex. I'm making big moves. That's a big move. Big money, big moves. That's a big move. I'm making big moves. That's a big move. Big money, big moves. That's a big move. Yeah. Make a play, don't talk about it. Master P, I'm bad about it. This one here for all that try to count me out and they still counting. Honestly, I never doubt it. Say the top is never crowded. Well, I'm trying to climb the mountain till I need a few accountants. Stock is rising, perfect timing. I'm in Brickle with the tribe. Shawty sliding, she won't sushi, she won't eel sauce.